Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am happy to uh, welcome you on uh, a webinar of the Ukrainian Arbitration Associ Association uh, about art disputes. Uh, my name is Elena Propolinska. I'm president of the Ukrainian Arbitration Association and uh, uh, in my capacity as a moderator of this event, I would like to introduce our today's speakers. We have a quite diverse panel uh, uh, covering different players of the art market. Uh, uh, so to start with Gian Giacomo Cirla, uh, who is artistic director, project manager and researcher. Uh, he is editor-in-chief of PR Room and the gallery director at OPR Gallery in Milano. And he is also involved as artistic director and creative consultant in several projects. Uh, from Ukrainian side, we have Alexander Dru, partner at Sayan Kaharenka uh, here in Kyiv. He is also a member of the Ukrainian board, board member of the Ukrainian Arbitration Association and member of uh, IDR committee of Ukrainian Bar Association. Uh, we also have uh, uh, Rodrigo Kare. Uh, who is a dual qualifying New York and Italian international arbitration lawyer. And his practice encompasses the representation of auction houses, art dealers, and other players uh, of the secondary art market in cross-border transaction and disputes. And last but not least, we have Stan Potter, uh, uh, who is a partner and uh, smaller, I'm not sure, smaller gang, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, uh, in Netherlands, uh, and he is also president of the Dutch Arbitration Association and CEO of the Court of Arbitration of Art. Uh, so uh, he runs a dedicated international dispute practice uh, with an emphasis on arbitration and arbitration-related litigation. So uh, we have art gallery, we have uh, uh, representative of the institution, we have lawyers acting in different capacity, and I'm sure we will have pretty interesting discussion uh, today. So starting with the art market, uh, John Giacomo, uh, could you please describe us uh, the uh, art market from the gallery owner perspective and probably potential disputes or typical disputes that arise? Oh, sure, easy, because there's a lot of possibility about this uh, in the art market, uh, especially from uh, my side. I'm, uh, thank you for having me today, and I'm really happy to bring uh, another point of view inside this conversation, because uh, it's really a connection between uh, the side of the art market and, um, yeah, I think it's to, to put some example on the table, but first, uh, the main difference we have to talk uh, on, I have to talk today, is about uh, the primary market and the secondary market, because of course, you know, uh, there's a, a lot of difference between the, uh, for example, the main difference is that in the primary market, uh, the gallery from my side, work directly with uh, a live artist so we produce uh, artwork and we uh, put that artwork inside the market for the first time so there's a, a kind of dynamic but on the secondary market the dynamic are totally different because on the secondary market usually a gallery deals with uh, a state with uh, the family business of uh, the artist with collectors with auction houses so the reality involves inside the collaboration around an artist, around an exhibition, around the artworks are totally different. Uh, when we spoke about the uh, primary market, to make some example, uh, a lot of problems born when uh, we have a standard contract uh, to manage a collaboration. Uh, but uh, a lot of time, uh, the standard contract uh, is not able to underline the difference between the artist, between the career of the artist, between the medium of the artwork. Uh, I don't know, for example, if I work with a sculpture, it's totally different if I work with a performer, because uh, I have different artwork in my hand, I have the different dynamics with the artist, uh, a sculpture is a unique piece, uh, maybe a performance uh, involve uh, 
um, an edition of uh, some artwork. So we have to deal also with edition. Um, one of the usual question I have when I deal with uh, edition artwork from a collector is uh, who ensure me about that the artist doesn't produce other art than the edition one. So if an artist works with an edition of 10, who ensure me that an artist doesn't want in 10 years or in 20 years to produce other artwork, maybe uh, with less difference to be able to start again another edition. Oh, this is an example. Or other ways, always in the primary market, we have um, disputes about uh, galleries and collector or gallery and artists. Uh, we have to work with artists that maybe start to work with us as a first gallery, but maybe during the time, uh, thanks also to our works, maybe find other galleries. And so we have every time to change our contract because, of course, the first contract we made with the artist will be totally different uh, based on his growth, based on the, his collaboration, his new collaboration with other artists. And uh, for another example, uh, we have uh, disputes when uh, a big reality enter inside a collaboration between a gallery and artist. So if uh, a big foundation want to start to work with an artist, of course, we know that the artists really want to work with a big foundation. But when a big foundation perfectly know that the artist wants to work with them, what happens to the gallery? Because the artist and the, the big foundation are agree to work together. The, maybe the artist and the, the artwork of the artist is produced by the gallery. So we need a totally different contract to manage this kind of collaboration. So uh, is a, a field, uh, I don't know how to, to say in an easy way, but uh, uh, is in the beginning uh, where the relationship with the artists, with the collectors, with other realities goes in the future. So it's impossible today for us to have a contract able to manage both the beginning of the relationship the beginning of the collaboration uh, and the growth of the artist, the growth of the galleries. Um, a lot of times, the big problem burns after uh, many years of collaboration because a gallery starts to produce an art or start to produce exhibition. And there's no problem when maybe an artist uh, sold artwork from, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, 1,000, 2,000 euros, for example. But after 10 years, after 15 years, uh, maybe the artworks are able to move a bigger amount of money. Uh, so a lot of realities start to be involved in the, the, the collaboration between the gallery and the artist. And a lot of collectors, a lot of art dealers want to come inside the collaboration. And the artist is happy to have uh, other experts inside the, the collaboration, but uh, we need a contract that uh, ensure the, um, the quality of the work, the possibility for a gallery to invest a lot of money and to be sure that in 10 years, uh, they have no problem and no trouble with the artist and with other realities. Uh, to make another example, when I work usually with younger artists, I make contracts that have a duration uh, like two years or maximum three years, because every two or three years, we need to think again about uh, our collaboration. But uh, usually some artists use this kind of uh, timing to, be, to produce the work and after two years to go to another gallery without any contract, without uh, any problem, with all the artworks to another gallery, because another gallery really want to, to find an artist with a lot of artwork already produced. So there's really, really a lot of problem between uh, uh, the relationship uh, of uh, the people involved in the art market. Uh, I think that uh, the role of a lawyer and the, the ability to a lawyer to understand the art market, the primary and the secondary market, uh, is really helpful to, to help uh, uh, both the gallery, 
the artist, the collectors, and every reality involved in the art market, because uh, is uh, the contract, uh, the right contract, uh, able to manage this kind of uh, collaboration are uh, the strong basis uh, to create uh, uh, the work of the gallery the, and uh, the future exhibition and the future growth of an artist. Thank you, Jen Giacomo. Uh, so would any uh, would you, other speakers have any comments? I understand that it's not uh, entirely legal topic, but still. Uh, uh, thank you. I was just wondering, um, uh, did you have a, like, a situation in practice where an artist wanted to get out of the contract or somehow terminate it uh, or had a dispute? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. There's a lot because, uh, of course, at the beginning, when an artist starts to, to work with the gallery, he's uh, happy to, to see everything. Of course, you know, he starts to work, he finds a gallery that wants to put a lot of money in his work. And so he, he is happy to, to see every contract. After uh, two years or three years of work, uh, uh, the artists usually start to, to understand that he is growing, he's growing a lot. And maybe others are to be interested in the work of the artist. And the artists start to think how to go out of a contract to be free to go to another gallery. So I had a, a problem like this uh, a year ago, also during the COVID, because an artist, uh, a collaboration I have after three years, we, uh, we uh, was near to the end of the contract and uh, start uh, one month before to deal with another gallery. When he finished the contract with us, we have no power to take some artworks of the artist and to uh, be inside the new collaboration. Uh, so, yeah, sure, it's uh, something that happens uh, often, uh, especially in the primary, in primary market, because uh, in the primary market, uh, usually you, you start to work with an artist, uh, I don't know, at uh, 23, 25 years old, and maybe you go on with the collaboration in the 30, 35, 30 years old. After the 30 years old, usually, as average, the artists start to be bigger and start to grow really fast. And they think that uh, a lot of time, uh, the problem was in that timing, starting from 35, 38, 40 years old and more, because the situation totally changed. Uh, the money around the artwork of the artist totally changed and the problem comes, uh, of course. And uh, when uh, an artist, uh, have more power, uh, the dynamics inside the collaboration totally change. We start at the beginning in a situation in which the gallery uh, has more power, of course, because uh, start to work with the artists to promote their work. And we finish uh, when there's more power than the gallery. And uh, if uh, there's no uh, a human relationship, uh, it's really difficult to, to go on with the collaboration because uh, the artist perfectly know that uh, he can move from the gallery without any problem. Hey, what, what are the kind of arguments that you see then come up and being raised by the artists uh, that uh, they use to try to get out of under uh, your uh, continuing representation of them? Is that that you as a gallery might do insufficient in terms of marketing these specific uh, an artists? Is that what they uh, try to raise as an argument, or are they uh, disputing the percentage that uh, uh, is going to the gallery holder? What what are the actual arguments in those disputes? Oh yes, uh, usually start with the percentage, of course, because uh, they want to change the relationship has changed the power inside the relationship, of course. Also, the needs of the artist uh, totally change. Uh, of course, it's not a fault about only the artist. Uh, a lot of time, it is also the gallery that uh, wants to work in not uh, uh, a clean way. Uh, but yeah, start with the percentage, but after 
uh, a lot of artists start to want to have many galleries. When they want to have many galleries, a lot of problem balls because a gallery like the mine is happy to have an artist in common with other galleries. But we need to be sure that the other galleries are a totally different market, a totally different group of collector, maybe abroad from us. Uh, but we have no, no possibility to, to stop an artist if uh, he wants to work with a gallery in a city near to us. That is a big problem. Well, because I'll, maybe I'll... we... Unless, of course, you agree to exclusivity or exclusivity in a certain restricted way. Yeah, a solution is the exclusivity, but the exclusivity has another problem because today less artists accept an exclusivity. Also, the big name, uh, I know, um, for example, JR, JR that uh, today work with the Pace Gallery, with Galleria Continua, uh, with Perro 10, uh, three of the biggest gallery in the world and uh, no, not the Perrotin, not the Galleria Continua, not the Pace Gallery propose an exclusive to the artist because the artist say no, because the artist wants to work with many galleries. So from one side, the gallery can't propose an exclusive to the artist because the artist don't want an exclusive. But on the other side, the gallery needs uh, uh, to be sure about the future because a gallery spend a lot of money behind the work of an artist. Uh, this, this is a, a really interesting point, this question, because uh, uh, seems that the gallery doesn't want to pay an exclusive. And so the artists, of course, say, OK, you don't pay an exclusive, I can work with that. But it's not like this, because uh, if the artist is really big, doesn't want exclusive. And uh, uh if there is no exclusivity, do you agree to, let's say, a fee, fee sharing with other galleries that are also representing the same artists? Is that, uh, are there the, then multi-party agreements in place between the variety of galleries and that one uh, specific Depend. artist? Depend, depend on the, also on the relationship, other relationship, uh, adding to the collaboration with the other galleries. So for example, I have an artist in common with other three galleries, with other two galleries. We have three galleries that work on the same artist, but since uh, we are happy to work together, we have uh, a deal between us. But uh, many times the artists decide to work with the galleries abroad uh, and uh, we have no contact with the galleries and the other galleries don't work want to have uh, uh, ideas with us. So in that situation, we can do, we, we have two ways. The first one is to work together on the same series of artwork and we can split the percentage. The second way is that the galleries, the two galleries work on different series, different projects. So all the project, all the artwork from one project is uh, sold by my gallery and uh, the other project uh, is uh, managed by the other gallery. So we can split uh, the artwork, but it's so complicated. It's so complicated because usually a collector that's coming to the gallery maybe wants uh, uh, an artwork, maybe see a new series, but wants an artwork from the previous series. And what's happened when the gallery has the new series and a different gallery have the previous one? You have to, you need to have a deal with the gallery saying maybe that if you bring to me some collectors, thanks to your exhibition, I give you a percentage. But every time is totally different. Every gallery wants different things. Uh, so it is it's really hard to find, uh, I don't know, not a standard, but something that is really used to many different situation. I Today, can also Im imagine that if you're a uh, one of the most highly reputed uh, uh, galleries out there in the world and there's an artist that doesn't want uh, exclusivity with you and you for your own reasons as a gallery may also not want that but then that gallery may have an interest of that artist uh, not being affiliated with anything else but a, a different top-notch uh, high-end uh, gallery. So you need to try to avoid that uh, 
uh, there's another gallery of a lower repute that is also affiliated with that artist. Is that also something that you see come by? Yeah, yeah, happens. But uh, I see this situation, I saw this situation uh, really less time, really less. Uh, I, I, I think, yeah, I, I think uh, we could discuss <laughs> various uh, modalities yeah, <laughs> of uh, art market. It's indeed very diverse uh, and dynamic. Uh, I would suggest to move to a bit different topic, a topic of museums and uh, Ukrainian record <laughs> in, in, in this area. So in the end of last year, the hot topic discussed uh, in Ukraine was uh, the Dutch court decision regarding uh, Crimean treasures. Uh, so Alexander, could you tell us a bit about this case? Yes, definitely. Uh, many thanks, Olena, and I'm very happy to uh, speak today at this webinar uh, together with uh, all the other speakers. And uh, this is indeed a very interesting case involving Ukraine. It dates back to 2014 and even uh, 2013, because the original loan agreements uh, for the exhibition uh, were concluded back in 2013. And uh, let me just quickly summarize what happened. And before that, just a small disclosure. I, I have an involvement in this case. So uh, I act as a, a as an expert uh, for one of the parties, the uh, Allard Pearson Museum of the Amsterdam University. Therefore, I will describe the facts, uh, describe the arguments raised by the party, but will not comment on any, like the strength of these arguments or any like contentious points. Uh, so to briefly describe the dispute, uh, there were in fact originally five loan agreements. So there were four Crimean museums and one museum from Kiev. So there was no dispute with the museum in Kiev. All the uh, treasures uh, were returned. Uh, the dispute was with the four museums located in Crimea. Uh, the loan agreements uh, were actually originally with uh, two museum, uh, new museum. The first one is Landes Museums in Bonn, this, and uh, the second one, Allard Pearson. So it, were, it was in fact, uh, each loan agreement was tripartite. Uh, so the uh, exhibitions at the Bonn Museum were completed, and then the next exhibition was scheduled to be held at Allard Pearson Museum from February to May 2014. Uh, due to the events that happened in March 2014, with the annexation of Crimea by the Russian Federation and uh, loss of control uh, of Ukraine over the uh, museum museums that, that remained in Crimea. Uh, there was, in fact, a dispute uh, whereby the uh, Allard Pearson Museum received two competing claims. The first one from the four Crimean museums, and these were contractual, originally contractual claims based on the terms of the loan agreements that the uh, certain objects had to be returned uh, within a certain deadline. And the competing claim was from the state of Ukraine, uh, who claimed that uh, the relevant treasures belonged to the state of Ukraine, and they're part of the Museum Fund of Ukraine. And uh, at the end, uh, the Allard Pearson Museum did not make any decision and uh, decided to suspend the performance and the loan agreements. And uh, the Crimea Museum eventually filed a claim uh, with the uh, district court in Amsterdam, and Ukraine then joined uh, this uh, case uh, as an additional claimant uh, with uh, also its own claim against the museums. So interesting point because uh, we are here uh, in the Ukrainian Organization Association uh, event that uh, all these loan agreements actually contained arbitration clauses. So the disputes were originally supposed to be referred to the International Commercial Arbitration Court uh, in Ukraine, in Kiev, but um, the museums filed their claim directly uh, in the Netherlands and uh, the other side, the other parties did not object. So uh, that was uh, a decision that was taken. Uh, so that is the example that uh, this uh, contract can also have arbitration clauses, but for a variety of reasons, they are not always used in practice. Uh, so the courts still remain uh, 
like uh, probably more straightforward and understandable option. Uh, the main position of the parties uh, were that uh, Crimean museums alleged that there is a contractual claim and the contract should be performed. Uh, the contract was not terminated in any way dissolved. And uh, basically the uh, Olive Pierce Museum had this obligation which they should honor. Uh, the claim of Ukraine was that of an owner saying that uh, whatever the contractual arrangements between the parties uh, to this loan agreements, uh, the actual owner uh, is Ukraine, and therefore the objects cannot be returned uh, to Crimean museums. Uh, there were actually a lot of technical moments in terms of uh, how these museums were arranged. Like one of the Crimean museums, it was directly subordinated to the Ministry of Culture of Ukraine, three others, uh, they were founded by the uh, Autonomous Republic of Crimea at the time. So uh, the status of property, uh, there was also challenged because uh, technically the uh, property was state property, but uh, all the museums had so-called like right of operative management, uh, which under Ukrainian law, it's, uh, uh, it's not like a lease, but it's a type of like possessory right uh, that um, a party who has who has it can protect uh, in the same way as uh, ownership. Uh, so uh, there are lots of competing points uh, that were raised. Uh, on top of that, uh, on top of the civil law relations, so there were also matters of whether they are properly exported out of Ukraine under proper licenses where certain international instrument and Dutch law uh, provisions relating to uh, the return of property should, should apply. Uh, in the end, uh, currently we have the judgments of the Court of Appeal, uh, which said that uh, in terms of the museum, that museum lawfully suspended the performance. Uh, so because of these competing claims, uh, it was lawful uh, for the Amsterdam Museum to have a doubt who is a proper creditor. And therefore it uh, uh, could not give these objects back to any of the parties. And um, the second point was uh, who is actually the uh, party uh, with a proper rightful claim uh, to have these objects. The court finally found that it is Ukraine. And in light of that, uh, it also applied the provisions of Ukrainian uh, law uh, relating to uh, termination of obligations. So basically that obligation can be can become impossible to be performed. And in, in situation when uh, the court ruled that the object should be returned to Ukraine, not to the Crimean museums, uh, the obligations under the original loan agreements, they, were, they became impossible to perform. Uh, so in a nutshell, this is the dispute. Uh, there are obviously many angles, but uh, uh, I would be happy to address additional points. Yeah, Alexander, I've got a yeah. couple of observations uh, 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 for you, uh, given that I'm a lawyer in the Netherlands and I've been uh, following this case uh, a little bit and know some of the uh, lawyers on the record as well as uh, one uh, deputy judge of the Court of Appeal who was about to be signed on uh, with this case. Uh, but he had a conflict of interest because uh, this person was also affiliated with the University of Amsterdam. Um, but it's interesting to see that the last judgment uh, stipulated that there was declaratory relief and, and basically stating that the obligation to uh, return the uh, uh, Crimea treasures has just uh, legally come to an end. So there's not an obligation anymore to return to the Crimea Museum, um, which is interesting because it doesn't specifically say what then to do with the treasures. Eh? That's, that's, that's not literally in the judgment. Uh, meanwhile, I understood that a Supreme Court appeal has been lodged by the Crimea uh, Museum. 
So that means that upon the lodging of this uh, 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 case at the Supreme Court, it will probably take another year uh, because it was only last month that the uh, Supreme Court appeal was uh, commenced. Probably take a year, maybe a bit more up until we know what the uh, Supreme Court considers. What's interesting for the audience, I think, uh, is the, uh, a little bit of the background of how Dutch uh, Supreme Court uh, um, uh, proceedings work. Um, in the Netherlands, we've got two uh, full instances of court. So both at the district court level and the court of appeal level, uh, you can bring in new facts, uh, all new evidence, um, and, and, and seek a uh, decision. It's not that a uh, appeal is just limited to points of law as in other jurisdictions, but if you go to the Dutch Supreme Court, uh, there is a limitation and a restriction towards the type of claims that you can make. So no new facts can be introduced anymore. And uh, the Dutch Supreme Court is only making an assessment whether or not the Court of Appeal made the right decision. And facts or uh, issues that relate to foreign law are considered facts and facts are established in the highest instance by the Court of Appeal. So they can't change anymore. Uh, the interpretation of, uh, in this case, then Ukrainian law cannot change in front of the Supreme Court anymore. So it will be very interesting to see how this uh, plays out. And what happens with the actual enforcement of the decision? Is it pending until the Supreme Court takes decision? So uh, what the Court of Appeal decision uh, uh, clarified is that uh, the district court judgment uh, remains in effect. And I believe that the district court judgment contained the uh, decision. Let me see, I've got it actually open on the uh, computer. So, yes, there was an order for the crim to condone the um, delivery of the Crimea treasures to the state of Ukraine. So, ba so basically uh, abbreviated, there was an order uh, for the Crimea treasures to uh, be returned, well, not to the museum, but to the state of Ukraine. And that decision has now been upheld in this respect. So in principle, you'll have the situation that there's an order for those to be returned or uh, delivered to the state of Ukraine. However, uh, the uh, museum that has the uh, possession of uh, these Crimea treasures is just retaining them in their possession up until the Supreme Court has uh, rendered judgment. And I, I, I don't believe that um, there are much objections uh, in that respect by the parties. Okay, okay. And so saying, thank you for your comments. Uh, I would uh, just mention that in terms of this termination of obligation, there were in fact uh, two uh, arguments. The first one related to uh, dissolution or termination of the entire contract uh, due to the changed circumstances. And the court uh, of appeal commented that uh, that was not necessary to go to that stage because it already dealt with the matter of this termination of obligation. Uh, so basically, uh, due to this impossibility to perform, uh, once it said that uh, the object should return to Ukraine, they cannot be returned person to the terms of the contract to Crimean regimes. So that was uh, enough. And the court of appeal then said, it's not necessary to look into this uh, whole termination of agreement argument. Okay, thank you. Um, if we do not have any other comments, let's move to the next topic. Uh, and next topic uh, concerns um, expropriation and restitution of artworks. And when we discussed with Rodrigo uh, this topic several months ago, so we discussed it in uh, from the angle of Second World War and some famous cases uh, uh, of uh, originating from that uh, uh, war. And uh, coincidentally, uh, today we have a new, in Ukraine a very specific situation. And uh, I, I think the topic we are going to discuss could be perfectly applicable uh, 
uh, to some other expropriation cases, uh, um, probably. Uh, so, but let's let's discuss it because I, I think the topic itself itself is very interesting and the cases are very interesting. So, Rodrigo, the floor is yours. Thanks, Elena. Um, let me start sharing my slides. Okay. Do you see my presentation? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, as a preamble, of course, the cases we will discuss our cases which arose during the Second World War or during the Nazi uh, era, uh, but just because it happened that there were the historical claims, of course, the, the system lends itself uh, to other claims, as uh, Olena suggested. Uh, and of course, the most famous case concerned the Adele of Klimt and other four paintings from, um, from this painter. Um, and so, and, and the particularity of this area is that all these claims um, were filed before the U.S. courts and went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And so we'll start for the first question, which is how, how is this possible that you can go to the U.S. Supreme Court for something that happened in Austria, as in the case of uh, Ms. Altman versus Austria, or in Europe over so many years ago during the Second World War or just before that? Well, it is possible because the person to the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act statute, which is a statute that which is present, I think, in also many other jurisdictions, which states the basic principle, which is you cannot sue a foreign government before domestic courts. However, in the United States, there is also an exception, and the statute uh, essentially says the district court shall have original jurisdiction against a foreign state as to any claim in which uh, where the foreign state is not entitled to immunity. Of course, we, we are talking a very narrow exception, very few cases in which a state is not entitled to immunity. And, uh, and the, the, this in particular, um, first requirement for a state not to be able to claim immunity is first, that there is a violation of international law. It will see what international law is for the US, for the US Supreme Court and that there is a connection between the property and the United States. In particular, the, the exception that was relied in the cases we will be discussing is that the property or any property exchange for such property is owned or operated by an agency or instrumentality of the foreign state. And there's a study the case of a foundation or a museum or a gallery, which is state owned, that qualifies for the purposes of the statute. Um, and then we go, precisely what happened in the Altman versus Austria case. Uh, pursuant to um, Rule 03 of the uh, Foreign Sovereign Immunity Act, um, there an exception is that the agency at issue has an instrumentality which is engaged in a commercial activity in the United States. Um, what happened in, in, in the Altman versus Austria case, uh, what happened is that the um, uh, Block and Guare family, that was a very prominent family in Austria, um, had the, the owner of these paintings, Mr. Ferdinand Brockenbauer, who escaped Austria after the Anschluss in 1935. After he escaped, the Nazi government seized his, all his assets, his sugar company, his beautiful palace in the center of Vienna, and five, six paintings actually from Gustav Klimt. There was some debate at the time as to whether um, the Adele Blockenbauer, which is actually the woman you see in the painting, wanted for the paintings to be donated to the Belvedere Gallery in Vienna. Uh, but eventually this was discussed in the case. There was a will from Mr. Ferdinand Blockenbauer saying that he wanted all the paintings to be bequeathed to his niece, uh, Miss Maria Allman. Miss Maria Allman, moved to the United States just after the Anschluss and became a US citizen. And she lived all her life in the States until a few years ago when, when she died. And, um, uh, and, um, and Miss Alman became aware in the 90s that these paintings, in particular the Adele, were exposed in the Belvedere Gallery. So she contacted her uh, family lawyer, essentially. Uh, there was uh, Mr. Uh, Schemberg who himself descends from a famous Austrian composer, Mr. Andor Schoenberg. Um, and the, initially they started to pursue their claim before the Austrian Restitution Commission. 
Um, and so what happened that they, they, uh, they filed their application with the court, uh, sorry, with the, with the commission, which is a commission composed by professors, by art historians, and by lawyers. And the commission said, no, we do believe that the, the paintings belong to Austria because Adele Alman wanted the paintings to be donated to the gallery. And that was, and that was the resolution. They considered appealing within the Austrian system, but the, the, the catch is that to go to the, to the Austrian uh, Supreme Court, you need to pay in advance 1% of the value of the assets. Even when you're talking about five paintings for Gustav Klimt, you can imagine that the, the fees that Ms. Salomon would have had to pay uh, would, would have been a fee of three or four million. Of course, she could not afford that. So they, they found a solution, which was suing in the United States. And that's and that the, what we discussed before uh, is the premise for jurisdiction. And uh, uh, a lawyer found this particular detail. The gallery, the Vedere Gallery was indeed engaged in commercial activity in the United States because they published, among other things, a book, the book that we see in this in these slides. Um, I, I think that not, the book is no longer available, might be for some reasons. So they published a book for the US Supreme Court. This was enough. The gallery engaged in a commercial activity in the United States. So we go to the next point. Uh, you might wonder at this point, okay, the US courts have jurisdiction, but what law, what law do you apply? Do you apply California law as it was in the case of Ms. Alman? Do you apply Australia? law? What, what law do you apply? So this is a point which has not yet been clarified by the Supreme Court. In the case of Allman versus Austria, it was pretty clear there was Austrian law, um, just because the claimant didn't contest that. In other cases, also they applied um, the local law of the expropriation, the local law of the, of the defendant state. In this recent case, Kasser versus uh, Thyssen Boromir's gallery, was, this was again a Spanish gallery owned uh, entirely by the Spanish state and concern uh, painting from Camille Pissarro that, that we see in this slide. And the, the question that came before the US Supreme Court was, what law do you apply? You apply Spanish law, which was the case of the, of course, the, of, the, uh, of the defendant, or do you apply, and in the case assistance, uh, it was a ninth, ninth circuit, so it was California again, or do you apply California law, or do you apply US federal law? And the US Supreme Court, um, uh, sorry, in this case, was the escort the appeal for the Ninth Circuit. So this case was argued just a few days uh, ago before the U.S. Supreme Court. So we'll see what happens with this case. But th this makes a big difference because if you apply the common law rule, the common law rule is nemo dat cono habit. A thief cannot give ownership. So if you purchase from somebody who stole the painting or if the, of the some point of the transmission chain of the, of the painting, the painting was stolen, there is no such a thing as good faith as, a, as a, and, and therefore um, the, the original owner of the painting can very well uh, sue the, the, the actual owner of the painting just because ownership was never legally transferred. Or of course we have the civil law rule, which is la possession vortit, it come, comes from the, from the Napoleonic code. And, and exemplify, is exemplified in the principle of good faith. Uh, a purchaser which has no idea that the painting is stolen, uh, purchases in good faith and the, the, there is valid, valid trust for a title. So this will be a question before the US Supreme Court and of course has an important effect on the, on the substance of these claims because the, under the civil law rule, this, this restitution claims become much more, much more difficult. And then we go to the next, question you may have, which is how can, how is, how is the, US, the, the, the US federal courts can adjudicate these claims where these are facts that happened in Austria or in Germany or in Spain, whatever, many, many years ago. And this came up in the Germany versus Philip case, uh, which was um, this, uh, decided by the US Supreme Court last spring of 2021. And, uh, and the, the US Supreme Court made this interesting consideration. We will be surprised if we might even initiate reciprocal action if a court in Germany adjudicated claims by Americans that they were entitled by hundreds of millions of dollars because of human rights violations committed by the United States government many years ago. And in fact, in this case, you had descendants of German judicial dealers during the, again, Second World War in Germany, and their descendants sued Germany. The US Supreme Court said, 
we cannot adjudicate a claim between nationals of the same state. Will be, there, will be, there will be a gross violation of a foreign relations with, with a particular candidate. This is a question, this is a matter for the executive, it's not a question for the court. Uh, in the particular case, the claimants, uh, the plaintiff argued that there was here a question of genocide, which is a violation of public international law. In fact, there is a, a United Nations Convention against genocide. The Supreme Court said, yes, we do recognize that uh, genocide is a violation of international law, but for the purposes of the statute, uh, this, this doesn't matter. This is not what the Congress had in mind in 1976 when they issued this Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. And then we go to a very uh, recent case where the court went a step a little further than what we saw before. So no claims between nationals. In this recent, recent case, argued before the, uh, the Seventh Circuit, which is the, in this particular, which is a, a case under uh, the law of Illinois. And then the case decided by Judge Easterbrook, who is a conservative and has a very conservative view of, of, um, of the law and, and the international sovereignty of the United States. So the, here the court went a, a step a little further. They said, this is a triple foreign action. We have something that happened in France in the 40s between nationals of, other, of European countries. Um, and of course, the defender here was the Société Nationale de, de Chemin Français, was the, the national French railway. So the, the court went a step a little further. They said we cannot adjudicate claims uh, even when nas the nationalities are different if there is no connection with the United States. Um, the, 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 the plaintiff have, again, um, requested certiorari uh, to the US Supreme Court. We will see. I don't think the US Supreme Court has granted certiorari, but maybe this case or similar cases will go to the Supreme Court at some point. Um, and finally, uh, the last point, there is a limitation period? No, there is no limitation period. This was discussed in Osha versus Oldman. The US Supreme Court said, uh, in, in, and for, for the purposes of the, of the expropriation exception, in, uh, we are adjudicating the claim of immunity itself. So it doesn't matter that the events happened before 1976, which is a year when the F FCIA was issued by the, by the US Congress. It doesn't matter because the, the FCIA governs claims for immunity. So if, if a claim is raised in a, in a current case, that, that's, that's enough for, for the statute. And finally, what this has to do with arbitration? It has because after the US Supreme Court uh, decision, um, Ms. Ullman decided to go to arbitration. The, the case was decided by three arbitrators uh, seated in Vienna under Austrian law. Um, and of course, because there were questions about enforcement of a, of a judgment in the merits from the US in Austria. So arbitration, of course, is an advantage of the New York Convention. And that's all from me. Um, thanks a lot. And uh, you have my contacts here if you have any questions. Thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, so any comments or questions from the panel? Yeah, just one comment, uh, and referring to the woman in gold case that uh, Rodrigo uh, uh, was discussing. It's interesting see, to see how actually does this exception in uh, US legislation was used to increase pressure on the Austrian government uh, to allow uh, uh, this person to eventually arbitrate the matter in a private arbitration uh, uh, um, uh, rather than doing anything else in terms of the uh, dispute uh, um, resolution itself. Austrian court proceedings, as you mentioned, were too costly and perhaps also had too little of a edge in terms of uh, um, uh, independence at that time uh, because of the relevance of, uh, of the pieces of art. But I think uh, for the audience, it's interesting to see how these uh, domestic court proceedings can act as a triggering factor to eventually agree to a, um, a submission agreement, an ad hoc arbitration on those kind of issues. And uh, uh, that's also something which, is, um, uh, which would be open at, uh, at CAFA, but more on that later. 
Yeah, of course, there is, uh, there is a convention, as you might be aware, for art restitution, uh, the UNESCO convention. The problem with the UNESCO convention is that there is no arbitration. So it's difficult to force a state to arbitrate. And of course, yes, they did use uh, US proceedings as a, uh, as a way of, of forcing Austria to arbitrate. And in fact, we see how bad it can go with the other case, with the case, I guess, in the Spanish kingdom, uh, because in the other case, they went to the, before the, the US courts also on the merits. And, that, and, and there, the, the question of Spanish law versus US law uh, arose. Of, uh, the enforceability of an arbitral award uh, is much more convenient for for plaintiffs. Just uh, one uh, small question from my side. I was just wondering that uh, uh, in in the situation you described, as I understand, there is a state or state entity somehow involved. But uh, what, for example, is the would be the situation if uh, this was just a private dispute uh, between two owners, uh, one alleging that uh, there is some uh, stolen property, the other defending that uh, he or she bought it at an auction at a fair price. Uh, would the same consideration, limitation and other defenses apply or there will be some additional ones? Well, there will be an entirely private dispute, right? So you, there will be a question yeah. of, of assessing uh, what, is the, what is the forum but this, normally, normally the forum for private actions is either the, the, the place where the event took place, that's for torts, or for, or for contracts is the place where the defendant resides. If we're talking about an individual or a company, uh, for example, that will be the natural thing. In this particular case, since they were, the, the plaintiffs were able to rely on the fact that the particular entity that they sued, because also in this case, we're talking about private entities, we're talking about the, the Belvedere Gallery, which is a museum. It's a, it's a company, it's a company incorporated in Austria. Same story for the foundation in Spain. But since they could use the fact that those private entities were owned by a state, well, yes, you can sue a state before the US courts if the exceptions that we discussed uh, uh, apply. And, and of course, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident that also bilateral investment treaties could be used in this, in this type of claims, again, when you go against a state. But of course, since we're talking about events that took place well before bilateral investment treaties started to be used, uh, the, the, this, this, this system was the, the, the one that made more, most sense for, for the plaintiffs. Thank you. So um, let's move to the uh, to our last topic, and our last topic was partially mentioned already by Stan. So uh, court of arbitration for art, the unique institution designed for arbitrating disputes in this area. So uh, Stan, could you please tell us about the institution itself, its idea, and uh, what kind of disputes it could consider? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Elena, for giving me the opportunity and inviting me in the first place to uh, to speak here at the UAA uh, uh, event. So thank you for that. Uh, so one of the hats that I have on is being the CEO of the Court of Arbitration for Art. Um, it's a, a joint venture that has been incepted a couple of years ago between the Netherlands Arbitration Institute and the Authentication in Art uh, in Foundation. And the idea was that um, um, a working group established of uh, predominantly art lawyers, they basically saw a huge gap in the dispute resolution market. Flaws in terms of domestic court proceedings of which they knew uh, that uh, uh, the market could do better. And there are a couple of uh, issues that were lacking in domestic court proceedings of which that working group thought um, uh, there can be some advantages if we would do this in an arbitration. Uh, for example, uh, experts, uh, getting the right expertise on board, um, both as the independent experts to a decision maker, but also expertise within the body of decision makers was considered very important. Confidentiality, another issue, um, time, 
time and expense is also something that was uh, very important. Those were the main factors driving the idea of forming a specialized institution for the resolution of art disputes. Uh, but there was not one yet with that dedication. And um, uh, the working group came into contact with the Netherlands Arbitration Institute, which is a uh, arbitration institute, the most renowned one uh, in uh, the Netherlands, uh, which has decades of experience in administrating arbitrations. So in order to form a proper institution for the resolution of artworks, we considered it more important to not invent the wheel uh, uh, new, but to link up with the Netherlands Arbitration Institution, which can properly run the administrative part of an arbitration. However, uh, 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 the front office, so to say, of the institution is the Court of Arbitration for Art. And uh, there are specific elements uh, in the rules and in the proceedings that will basically um, uh, consider all the disadvantages that we have saw, we have seen in uh, the domestic court proceedings. So the type of art disputes that could be resolved through CAFA arbitration, those are really wide. Uh, whatever you could contemplate as being in the widest sense, a art dispute is something that you could resolve through a, uh, a CAFA arbitration. Authentication disputes, restitution uh, disputes, uh, we've discussed that uh, briefly uh, with uh, ad hoc arbitration, but it's something that can be done through CAFA as well. Um, all kinds of other disputes, auction disputes, owners, sellers, buyers, auction houses, galleries, storage companies, museas, you name it, uh, whatever uh, disputes they may have. Uh, uh, I think that CAFA has on board the proper expertise uh, for the resolution of all these uh, 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 variety of uh, uh, disputes that can arise in the larger art market. So I think there are four main criteria that makes the Court of Arbitration for Art unique and um, with unique selling points over other ADR institutions or domestic court proceedings. The first of all, the um, tailoring of the expertise on board in the decision-making process. That's one. Second, uh, confidentiality. Uh, third, uh, time and cost efficiency. And last, also the international enforcement aspect, which we should not uh, um, uh, take lightly. Um, first, a couple of words on the expertise that is included in the um, uh, CAFA arbitration uh, proceedings. So uh, there is a pool of arbitrators which now encompasses well over 200 uh, neutrals from across the grow. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the most renowned global art lawyers uh, are forming part of this panel of neutrals. So I think there we definitely succeeded in what we uh, sold out to do. And this basically provide cutting edge uh, 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 expertise for the market so that it is reliable, it is trustworthy uh, for uh, the resolution of these kind of uh, uh, disputes. Um, in addition to having experts on board who will thus be neutral, the decision maker itself, the arbitrator, uh, there is a pool of experts, also uh, consisting of a very interesting pool of globally renowned experts. That's something that we're still working on to uh, enhance and increase, um, but that's a very interesting aspect. And a third point of the expertise within uh, CAFA proceedings is the ability for the arbitral tribunal to appoint a technical process uh, advisor in certain uh, issues that can assist the decision makers. And that's an element which is more known in uh, the United States than any, anywhere else where uh, the um, uh, courts often do uh, appoint a third party who assists in, for example, discovery aspects. Um, 
Here, the technical process advisor can assist uh, in specific instances, the, the tribunal. But those are, let's say, the three bullet points uh, of which we believe that it is unique uh, for, uh, for the process. Confidentiality, uh, that is something which is not available in uh, domestic court proceedings. So in all arbitrations, uh, uh, the point of departure, or almost all arbitrations, the point of departure is confidentiality. That's incorporated in the body of the uh, rules in, uh, in, uh, in the CAF arbitration rules as well. There is the possibility for parties to uh, object against publication of awards. That's the way that we have structured it. Because on the one hand, we believe that it is interesting if parties do not object, that there will be a creation basically of a body of law uh, of art disputes. However, if there's only one of the parties that makes an objection, uh, it will uh, the final award will not be uh, published. But there is there's a balance there, confidentiality if anybody seeks it, but if there's not a de uh, big desire uh, to have the outcome uh, uh, treated confidential, it is interesting to use that as a body of law of, uh, uh, that we can use across the globe. Uh, third issue, time and cost efficiencies. What often happens if uh, art disputes end up in front of domestic uh, courts, there is not one level of court, but there are three or sometimes four, uh, uh, district court, court of appeal, Supreme Court, and sometimes even a cassation uh, court. It takes years and years the idea behind uh, CAFA arbitrations is that it's a uh, uh, one level of court proceedings only with the idea standard, I would say, in international arbitration that most disputes can be resolved somewhere between uh, 12 to 18 months, even if the matter is uh, significantly complex and uh, um, high stakes. And then the last issue, which is important uh, for arbitration in general, thus also for CAFA arbitration, is the ability to more efficiently enforce an arbitral uh, award over domestic court judgments. As Rodrigo already mentioned, it can be a, a pain in the ass to enforce a, a decision coming from a court in the United States, uh, somewhere outside of the United States think uh, most jurisdictions uh, do allow the um, uh, uh, a more efficient way to enforce foreign court judgments without a complete retrial but even in uh, our legislation in uh, uh, in the in the Netherlands then where I am practicing it is um, uh, uh, the point of departure is a retrial except for those instances where uh, certain requirements for efficiency are being met. But these are the key advantages, I would say, of uh, arbitration uh, at uh, the Court of Arbitration uh, for Art. There are more advantages. We could go more into detail, but time doesn't allow me uh, to do that. Um, what I think is of interest for the audience is that we're really uh, trying uh, to uh, have these kind of CAFA clauses incorporated into more contracts. We're very cautious about the fact that these can, clauses can also be agreed upon after the dispute has arisen. Um, CAFA is open for business uh, and we would lo look forward to resolving disputes that might come up. I think we've got the framework in any event set up that uh, uh, is unique and of interest. And, I would be happy to ask uh, or answer any questions that uh, other panelists might have. Yeah, I have a question. I know that in some, so it could be uh, seen as a like an industry arbitration, like uh, meaning that the industry is a art market. And for in some industry arbitrations, there are certain restrictions, for instance, with regard to the seat of arbitration, with regard to the applicable law. Are there any such limitations in CAFA? No, there are not, and uh, that's specifically uh, uh, not implemented because we would like the CAFA rules to be used globally. 
Uh, if you you are a auction house selling somewhere, uh, selling a great piece of art in uh, the United States, in, in whether it be Los Angeles or New York, you should be able to apply uh, New York state law if you would like, and also have New York as a seat of arbitration. But similarly, if it relates to a, uh, a auction uh, being conducted in uh, Hong Kong or an art gallery uh, over there, uh, we would very much welcome a uh, law applicable different than, uh, uh, well, the, just which the parties have, uh, have considered prudent. And with the seat, uh, basically the same. Uh, but for the seat, we do have a default if the parties don't choose anything else, that would be then The Hague in the Netherlands. And uh, do you co contemplate resolving also this more than NFT and uh, other uh, type of art dispute? Um, well, that's really an interesting question because uh, is an NFT dispute really a uh, um, art issue or more a tech orientated uh, uh, dispute and uh, in which industry arbitration uh, should then, uh, well, which one should be applied? It's an interesting question. Uh, we would be open for business, but I think uh, um, if you look at the uh, uh, list of arbitrators that we've compiled, we would also be uh, uh, very capable of handling uh, more tech slash art law oriented work. However, I think the more traditional uh, art disputes are the ones that we would be uh, um, 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 uh, trying to get in more easy than, than NFT disputes, for example. Yeah. But you never know how it develops. And that's, that's, uh, the, that's the issue. If, if, if there's an uh, interest in doing it, I'm sure we'll be able to get on board a couple of additional neutrals uh, uh, to act as arbitrator in those kind of disputes as well. Yeah. And what I think is also of interest uh, uh, for the audience is that what we've tried to do is form a pool of arbitrators, uh, predominantly of uh, the uh, world's most recognized art lawyers, but in order to ensure uh, procedures in accordance with all procedural rules and rules of due process, uh, there are a X amount of uh, arbitrators in the pool that have more of a general arbitration background rather than uh, being hardcore uh, art lawyers. And we believe that that is a, a, an appropriate uh, uh, balance. Uh, the parties can, of course, still decide to have an arbitration being decided upon by uh, three art lawyers. Uh, but we did think that it was important to include, at least in the pool, also a decent amount of, uh, uh, let's say, strict arbitration experts. Yeah. Thank you. Any comments from other speakers? And just to check, uh, I was wondering, uh, Stan, you said that uh, you are now uh, trying to include the uh, CAF arbitration clause into various contracts with various uh, uh, auction houses and other uh, contracts. Uh, what what is your expectation on the timeline? Uh, once you start doing that, uh, when do you expect the disputes start coming in? From well, that's country? also always a difficult uh, uh, question to answer, I think, because you never know when the first uh, dispute then arise out of a, uh, a contract that uh, uh, would now incorporate a CAFA clause. Um, I think uh, for the first so many arbitrations, uh, it is more realistic to anticipate that uh, uh, CAFA's work would arise out of ad hoc disputes and submission agreements uh, for arbitration rather than having those incorporated uh, in, uh, in, in general sales conditions, for example. But if that is being done, there will, of course, be a lag time uh, up until the, the first arbitrations would come in. I think in the meantime, uh, uh, specifically what I'm saying, ad hoc disputes is something that we could... Uh, uh, Taylor in the meantime. Thank you. Um, okay, if no, um, no other uh, questions or comments, I would like to thank all our speakers for this very interesting uh, discussion uh, from of, of our disputes from various angles and from various perspectives. I hope that have been interesting uh, for our audience. I, I would like to thank our uh, uh, audience as well for their attention. Uh, as a small announcement, I would like to say that we are going as an association. We have several uh, 
webinars, webinars already planned for forthcoming weeks. So stay with us. You could find uh, information uh, about our forthcoming events on our website. Thank you and bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you.